Great. Well, welcome, everybody. My name is John McCormick. I'm head of the Business Issues Committee for the Latvia Chamber. And so um, I'll be your host today, along with Holly Sunny from the Chamber, who will be doing a lot of magic um, behind the scenes, uh, Sarah and, and others. And so we're, this is our, I guess, quarterly, I suppose, uh, Coffee with the Mayor that we're, we're doing, where we get to hear directly from uh, Mayor Dury what's going on and uh, taking your questions. Uh, so the way we're going to do it is um, we'll have the mayor. He's got a 10, kind of a 10, 15 minute little opening kind of update on what's going on in the city to give us uh, so we're all up to date. I have a couple of questions for him after that that we'll do. And then we'll open up for Q&A uh, from all of you. Uh, I definitely want to make sure if you haven't done open up your meeting chat window on the side. Um, that's great for either questions that you want to ask if you don't feel comfortable asking or whatever. You can just type it in there. Or also Holly will be putting in kind of um, supplementary websites and links and all sorts of things uh, as it goes along to help with with uh, with um, with giving you um, places to go to reference the things that uh, the mayor talks about. So without further ado, ado Mayor Dury, let us know what's going on in Lafayette. All right, thank you, um, and thank you to all of you for your interest in Lafayette and and being on this Zoom. So early in the in, in the morning. Um, John mentioned I'll, I'll give a brief introduction, 10 to 15 minutes. I do have a, at least 60 minutes of good material about what's going on in Lafayette. <clears throat> so what I think I'm going to do is just talk about uh, the priorities that the council has set for the year. And then some of the other things I think will come out in our conversation, because there are a number of things that aren't in the priorities that I think are also very important for for people to know about. But first, for those of you who, well, if anyone has not heard, um, last week uh, the California Supreme Court uh, declined to hear the Save Lafayette appeal with respect to the Terraces project. So that litigation is now over and we will go through the, the, the process and the, the project will be built. So what that is going to mean for Lafayette, among other things, is 600 new patrons for the Park Theater when it opens, uh, 600 new patrons for the library, patrons for downtown retail. Uh, there's just new residents that we'll be welcoming to Lafayette. And I think a, an especially important part of it uh, is that <clears throat> uh, 63 of those units are below market. Uh, rental units. So, and, and that project will go ahead. Now, um, we're in a system now where the council as a whole uh, gets together uh, off campus, uh, but open to the public. It was on, on Zoom. Anyone could join, and uh, two of you did, uh, to hear the council discuss and set priorities for the next fiscal year. So, we started that uh, last year. We, we meet, we talk about it, and then in uh, a council session, we approve the priorities. So last year, we set priorities for the 2022-23 fiscal year. We met on February 11th to talk about our priorities for the 2023-24 fiscal year. And then at the last council meeting, we confirmed, yes, what we discussed in February, we want to have as our priorities. Now, as we speak, Narup, our city manager, and her team of managers are meeting, again, off campus at a quiet location to discuss those priorities and to see which ones they can staff uh, and uh, which ones we can afford with the city budget. And they'll come back to us in April with a work plan as to how they propose to carry out those council priorities. So it, it's a great process because then the whole council sets the priorities. It's not as if a mayor comes in and says, here's what we're going to do. The council set the priorities. The new mayor comes in and says, okay, we've got these priorities. Let's keep moving with them. And then each year we can look at it and adjust them. So the priorities for the uh, next year are pretty much the same ones as last year with some tweaking. So there are four of them. The first one is wildfire prevention, preparedness, responsiveness, and utility safety. And there are a number of things in under each of these categories that we're going to look at. For example, one of the things we want to focus on this year is improving our partnership with CONFIRE. 
And uh, we will be meeting with the chief. I think it's in, in May and talking about that. But there's ongoing cooperation uh, with CONFIRE. That's a very good relationship uh, for the city. And then also other agencies that have responsibilities, including PG&E, East Bay Regional Park District, and involve them more, those agencies more in our uh, wildfire prevention preparedness efforts. We also want to do more to engage the public, uh, making the public aware of what each resident can do to harden their home, because that's one of the, the critical things that we all need to do in order to make this city safer for all of us. Uh, this year, we want to do more to clarify responsibility regarding tree removal and brush clearing. Um, this is going to be a, a big fire danger year in the because of the amount of brush we're going to have with all this rain. Uh, there's going to be a lot more uh, grass, there's going to be a lot more brush, and it's going to dry out, and we're going to make, need to make sure that everybody clears their, their property of that. Um, we, uh, well, this grows out of the experience we had with the housing element, with the um, environmental impact report, and Attorney General Bonta's guidance on best practices for uh, evaluating evacuation in the context of an uh, environmental impact report. We want to develop thresholds of significance for evacuation times for each zone in the city. You know, that was one of the key parts of uh, Attorney General Bonta's advice, is that when you're uh, doing an impact report on a development, you should, the city or the community should establish thresholds of significance uh, for evacuation times. So we'll be looking into, into that. The second priority last year, and again, uh, this year, and I, I say shouldn't say second priority, number two priority, is improved pedestrian and traffic safety and multimodal mobility. So we'll be carrying on with the projects around the schools. We did a lot of the quick fix projects. We'll be looking at the medium term and longer term projects, which cost more money. We'll think about how we can uh, do those. Uh, uh, we will, as you know, we adopted Vision Zero as our guiding principle. Uh, and work is going on now on the local road safety plan as part of uh, uh, Vision Zero. That will be coming to uh, Transportation Circulation Commission, and then will be coming to the council in the next few months. We also received a congressional earmark, or what is it, community benefit grant, uh, sponsored by uh, Congressman Desaunier for the School Street Project. So we have that money. We'll begin the public process on considering that uh, probably in the fall. <clears throat> Priority number three is planning for the Mount Diablo corridor and downtown. And again, this grows out of our experience with the housing element. Um, as you all know, we needed to plan for 2,114 dwelling units uh, on our arena, you know, plus a, a, a cushion. Almost all of that is in our downtown. So the population on our downtown, if all of that were to be built, uh, would double. Um, so we need to plan now for how we can accommodate that. So um, last year, <clears throat> when we had that in our as one of our, our priorities because we knew that was coming. We had a thought that we would just generally plan for everything. This year, we're, we've got different levels of how we're going to approach it because it's, uh, it's such a, a major undertaking. So the first thing, if probably everyone knows, the city has purchased the Campania property. And if the city does buy the McNeil property on Plaza Way, uh, then we will look again at the Plaza Way overlay district, which was enacted by the council in um, 2012, and see, get public input as to whether we want to go forward with that plan or whether we want to tweak it in any way. But that depends on acquisition of the McNeil property. Uh, that has not 
uh, happened yet, but if it does, that will be our first priority in terms of, of planning, planning for what happens in the, the overlay district. The second priority is to develop objective design standards. And this moved up considerably uh, from last year because the concern is that if we start getting building in the downtown, we want to make sure that it it's conforms to design that we want to have in our city for the next 80 to 100 years. Uh, so we want to get that in place as, as soon as we can. The third thing, and this to me it is just incredibly important. If we're going to double the population in the downtown, we obviously cannot double the amount of cars in the downtown. So we need to look now at what we can do in the downtown so that people who live there, as well as people who come into the downtown, uh, don't need to do it by car. So ideally we would design our downtown so that uh, New people who are who are living there and the people who are living there now, it's easy for them to get around on foot, bicycle, other sort form of transit, uh, so they don't have to have uh, use vehicles to do their shopping, getting to school, going to to church, uh, any of the things that they might do in the downtown, and uh, that I think we need to do before there's any further. Uh, planning in any other area because that's sort of the the, the backbone of the uh, uh, the planning for the downtown. Um, and then, yep. Then we'll look at at zoning updates and changes and what we might be able to do to uh, protect commercial uses on the ground floor. So those th that's very important. Those are the things we'll look at. But then. If, we, if we're able to get past those things, then we'll try to plan as much as we can for the downtown. We ideally, you know, we, we, we wanna make sure we have parks in the downtown, because again, if we double the population in the downtown, we have to provide uh, play areas, parks for the residents. Uh, and we also, even beyond the downtown, we have to have additional playing fields if our population is going to grow that much. So there's just a lot of planning that has to be done. And then item number four, uh, last year and again this year, is developing a fiscal sustainability plan for the short and long-term needs of the city. Um, and that's, again, we, we, we met the, the council subcommittee, which is uh, council member Kwok and me, met two times to talk about that, but put that on hold while we waited to see what happened with the purchases of the property in the plaza block, because that would make a big difference in the city's fiscal situation if we were to purchase both of those properties. So that's the, the case we're in now as well. We're waiting to see what happens there. Once we know what happens there, then that committee will meet again. But we need to look at uh, whether we want to look at additional uh, revenue sources to meet the needs of the city. We, and if we go down that road, we'll of course have a lot of public input in terms of what the city, what the residents want the city to be, what the residents want uh, the city to be providing. Um, we, I, I'm sure that those of you who are taking part here can think of a lot of things you'd like to see the city be doing. We hear every day uh, from residents who uh, would like the city to have more playing fields. Um, I personally would like to see a protected bike path from every area of the city into the downtown uh, so that there's at least one safe way from each segment of the city. Uh, to get downtown safely on on bicycle, all of that costs costs money. So we need to think about how what we want the city to be twenty years from now, and how we're going to finance that. And there's a lot of other things going on, but I will uh, turn it back to John for questions. No, that's great. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mayor and Dury. And I, before I uh, have a couple of questions of my own, I do want to I think echo from the chamber's perspective. Um, I know the city, uh, city obviously Narup and the city council have always been very supportive of the chamber and downtown, but I will tell you that Mayor Dury and Vice Mayor 
Dawson have just taken to another level this year. I think probably reflecting the priorities that he talked about. I mean, we're in constant communication. We've jointly, both the city and the chamber have jointly uh, worked to reach out and helped individual businesses in town uh, been very, very quickly with, you know, no bureaucracy or anything like that. It's been uh, phenomenal. So, uh, so thank you for that. Yeah, I do have a couple. Of, and so for those of you that joined a little bit late, what we're we doing, I have a couple of questions to kind of get the ball rolling, but then we really want to hear from you. I mean, I think that's kind of the, the whole point of this. And so um, I have a couple of questions and then you can either raise your hand with Zoom physically if we can see you or enter your question in the chat and we'll uh, we'll go through them that way. And as uh, Mayor Dury mentioned, there's many other things to talk about, so we won't run out of things, but I think we definitely want to hear what's on your mind. But a couple of questions, uh, Mayor, to kind of kick things off. I think it's on the agenda as well. Um, Monday's um, city council meeting is uh, we did read and hear about a new uh, collaboration between Lafayette Senior Services and La Miranda Village. Uh, I think that's quite interesting and, and really nice. I wonder if you can shed a little light on that. Yeah, th this is a, a very exciting development for the city. And I see that Sharon Iverson, the uh, uh, chair of the board of directors of La Miranda Village, is, is on uh, we think very highly of what La Miranda Village has been doing in terms of providing uh, uh, opportunities for seniors, educational opportunities, recreational opportunities, social opportunities, and, and most importantly, providing services that help seniors stay in their homes, whether it's rides to medical appointments, uh, whether it's rides to, uh, to, to, uh, for shopping, uh, whether it's uh, uh, someone, a volunteer coming over and doing a small job at the home, or whether it's a reference to uh, a handyman or a, a, a service person who can uh, fix something at the home. We know from the surveys of Lafayette residents that the top priority of our senior uh, residents is to be able to stay in their homes. And we think that through a collaboration with La Mirinda Village, will be able to be able to to do that more effectively. So what that means in the short term is that the council has decided to allocate uh, $60,000 per year for the next two years. So this will be a pilot program to support memberships in La Mirinda Village for seniors who might not otherwise be able to uh, participate. The council will also uh, encourage uh, all residents of Lafayette to consider membership in La Mirinda Village, uh, because we think that if La Mirinda, if La Mirinda Village uh, scales up, uh, it'll be able to provide these services that will help our residents stay in the home. We think that's, La Mirinda Village has proven to be a very uh, 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 flexible, quick on its feet organization, able to respond to needs for seniors and prove that uh, with the response to COVID and setting up the first uh, vaccination sites, for example, that proved it during the the uh, uh, the New Year's storms uh, when uh, they were the first to be able to get mobilize the Boy Scouts to help seniors fill the sandbags and get them to their homes. So we're just really looking forward to this collaboration with La Mirinda Village. And I don't know, <clears throat> Sharon, if you would like to uh, to say anything. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you very much. I, I didn't put my face and picture here because I've got a dog who keeps jumping on my lap. And I thought that would be uh, a little uh, discouraging or, or uh, disappointing for others. Anyway, I'm just delighted to join uh, Mayor Anduri in uh, announcing this uh, program to you. We are very, very excited. It's been a work in progress for, for some time. And uh, I think the city has been just bending over backwards uh, to help us do what we think we need to do. And as uh, Mayor Anduri pointed out, we are gonna do our very, very best to accommodate. We do need to scale up, of course. Um, we are um, sort of a medium-sized uh, organization at this particular time, but we're really anticipating, we've already got some new staff on board and uh, we're really anticipating with uh, a great deal of, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, encouragement and uh, joy uh, about this new project. So again, thank you, Mirandurri and your council and the um, senior uh, commission for uh, giving us this opportunity. We really, really appreciate it. We will absolutely do our best. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you, Mirandurri. That's an amazing. Um... 
a kind of public private kind of partnership i think that is 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 really going to be great um one other question this one came from uh one of the attendees that i'll start is um obviously we've we've transitioned back to in-person meetings as you as you mentioned and some of them are hybrid i think they talked about the uh uh, City Council Planning Commission Design Review and Transportation Circulation Committees. Uh, there was a question whether there was any thought of having other, um, any of the other committees or commissions around town be or be hybrid as well. Again, meaning both in person as well as a Zoom option. Has there been any, any um, discussion about that or, or thoughts about that going forward? Yeah, there, there definitely have been uh, approaches from a couple of angles. Uh, doing the hybrid meetings is more res uh, resource intensive, uh, both in terms of, um, of technology and uh, personnel. Uh, so we've picked those four or, uh, boards to start with a hybrid, and we will evaluate how it works, uh, both in terms of how much it costs, how much public input we get, and most likely in uh, um, either a April or May council meeting, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss it. I mean, there clearly is a preference to encourage meeting virtually. That... Uh, my impression is that uh, meeting virtually during the pandemic has actually increased public participation in our meetings because people can, it's, it's just, it's it's easy to get to the meetings. Uh, it's uh, easy to listen in and then be ready to comment. Uh, you don't have to ha hang around uh, at, uh, during a, a three hour meeting in person. So, uh, we would like to encourage that. Just um, Council Member Kendall, City Manager Servatza, and uh, Communication Analyst uh, Erla and I uh, went to Sacramento on uh, Tuesday and met with some of our legislators to talk about some of our concerns. And one of our concerns was uh, the legislation relating to uh, virtual meetings. So we met with several of the legislators who were carrying uh, bills to uh, make it easier uh, to meet virtually, and we were encouraging them and we were telling them about our experience. So we hope that we'll be able to, uh, uh, well, uh, not just the public being able to come in virtually, but also uh, members of commissions and committees being able to meet virtually. Because we've already had some difficulty organizing some of the um, committees uh, that I've been the, the council liaison for in terms of getting. Uh, 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 quorums. And it was just a lot easier to get a quorum when we could meet uh, virtually on Zoom. So uh, my preference is to do as much as possible on Zoom because I think we've gotten more public uh, input that way. And uh, so we'll, but in terms of go, uh, having more hybrid meetings and all the equipment that that takes, we'll just need to evaluate that later. Great. Thank you very much, Mayor. All right, now the, we'd like to open it up to um, to all the attendees of the coffee. Is there anybody who has a question for the uh, for the mayor? That like the the brave soul that's going to kick this off. While we're waiting for a brave soul, I noticed uh, that our supervisor Anderson is on here, yes. and I I just uh, you know thank you very much for your interest in what goes in, on in Lafayette, and we are just so fortunate to have someone uh, representing us who is so interested in what we do and uh, you know works with us on, on our needs. So I just wanted to, uh, to thank you for that. But, but that's very kind of you, Carl. No, this is always so interesting to me because I do get to hear more in detail about the council priorities and, and from the rest of the community, what's on their mind. And I've so far, I've, I'm with you 100% on how we can make our advisory commissions and um, be able to participate remotely. We're encountering that with some of our, for example, our mental health commission with the county where it's representatives from all over the county, um, a third of which are consumers, people who have their own um, mental health challenges and others are family members. And for them to have to reconvene in person, they've really struggled with that. And so I'm hopeful that some of the legislation you mentioned will allow appointed um, commissions to really be able to, and committees, to have that ability. As an elected official, I'm very happy to show up in person, but I think when we have so many community volunteers engaged, I think that's great. So I'm so glad to hear you're doing that, as well as I'm a big fan of 
of the senior village too. And so uh, sharing what you're doing is just amazing to allow people to stay in their home. So I'll let you get to your questions, but thank you. Always happy to be here. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Supervisor. Uh, Cheryl McDonald, you, you have your hand up. Yeah, I always seem to have a hand up. <laughs> That's a good thing. Um, so I have a, um, a thought about the fire issue and the trees being cut down. Um, I mentioned this at the GPAC meeting, and I think I mentioned it at the Saturday City Council meeting, which is um, trees to some of the trees that we need to cut down that might be dead on personal property might be really, really expensive to cut down and financially might be uh, an issue for some homeowners. I just didn't want any homeowners to be frowned upon by fellow neighbors or council or staff. So my thought was, is there any financial grants that we can get from the state or from the federal government to help with, you know, people that are struggling to get, do the right thing, but just can't do it because it can cost four to $6,000 to cut down a tree. So that's my first thought. Um, and I know there's not a readily answer available, but just something to think about. Um, before you go on, let me take them one at a time because I tend to forget before you get to question number two. Um, okay. Uh, I, I, I know exactly what you mean because uh, during the storm, uh, 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 last week, uh, on one of well, a hundred foot incense cedar on our property fell, and it was a very good tree because it fell in the only place it could fall and not <laughs> in the structure. So, kudos to the tree for that. But the uh, the bill for removing the tree, uh, uh, obviously, there's demand pricing going on right now uh, for fallen trees. But yeah, it's it's considerable. So I, I hear that, and I'm just wondering if anyone representing an agency who's on this call is aware of those funds. And if there's not, that's something the city will be looking into because we realize that that it is a, a, a huge financial burden. But unfortunately, it's going to be necessary because we need to take down particularly the uh, the, the dead ponds. There, there may be firewise grants um, that are possible through Confire, and um, particularly since a lot of this has to do with hardening that you were talking about. And I think that would be a great discussion with Chief Richard about um, there is money set aside to work on wild land, wildfire mitigation, but also these firewise grants. So I would suggest considering that as a possibility. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Okay, Cheryl, sorry to interrupt you. What? Oh, no, it, it's okay. It's a, I, this uh, call and response kind of thing is kind of nice. Um, this might be for the chamber. Um, uh, the shuttle service, the little shuttle bus that was took people downtown on, I think it was in December, on the Thursdays. I actually took, made an intentional uh, effort and took a ride downtown on the bus, and I loved it. Um, and so I wondered uh, what your feedback was for that and whether or not that would be something that would be possible to continue, especially in what Mayor and Dury just talked about, which isn't just biking downtown, but you know, getting the shuttle into downtown, because I would do more of that if that was there. I think that's a good question. I'm actually going to turn it over to Sarah Regan, who's our uh, executive director of the chamber. I think she has an update on that, or at least commentary. Yeah, commentary more. Thank you, Cheryl, for taking it. Unfortunately, we didn't have a lot of takers on the shuttle bus. We were trying. I think um, our role as the chamber was really to promote it and to get communication out to as many people as we could. It was really truly run by the senior services and the spirit van. Um, and I know that they had, we did it for three weeks and re ridership did increase by the third week. I think it was just a matter of timing and location. And I don't think it's been, I think it was just tabled right now. My understanding, and maybe uh, Mayor and Dury can give a little feedback on that. But um, we were really here to really promote it. Like I said, increase communication. We ourselves took test rides on it. It was a great, it was a great way to get around town. I think it's just the timing of it at the time. Carl, would you like to say anything? Yeah, the city uh, uh, allocated part of its uh, American Rescue Plan Act funds to the Spirit to fund a, a holiday uh, downtown shuttle. Um, 
and as a, a pilot program to see how it worked. I think one of the things that we learned from that is that you do have to have consistency so that people can count on the shuttle uh, being there. And so I think if it had continued a bit longer and people had gotten, yes, yes, the shuttle is going to be here and yes, there is going to be room on the shuttle, I think we would have had a greater ridership. So we need to look at that again. I know this is something that we'll be considering you know, the, the La Miranda Spirit Band, which basically uh, Lafayette supports with grants from other organizations. But as we look at senior services and now the collaboration with the village, we will be also considering how all that uh, works together. So there'll be a, a new look at all of that. Okay, and I could go on, but I, I'm just gonna leave one more thing uh, on the table for everybody, including the senior uh, village that was there as well. Um, on channel 28, there is something called disaster preparedness for seniors. And it's on periodically and I don't, I haven't seen it. I haven't actually watched it, but it's, um, Seems like it, it was talking about gas, turning off gas, turning off electricity was what the blurb said. Um, I think those are really good things, especially coming the summer that maybe even the council could talk to, you know, have a little discussion about it as well. Um, it's just, it's not just for seniors, I would think it's reminding everybody how to turn off their gas. Where's their gas valve? Where's the electricity? Um, it had me thinking, I didn't watch the program that was just in the blurb. So I'm just gonna throw that out that was on channel 28 um, and I'll leave it there. I'm sure other people have comments too. Thanks. Cheryl, thank you, Cheryl. Great. And I think uh, David Bennett, you have your hands raised. Uh, yeah, actually, I can talk to a lot of those issues because I'm with Mobility Matters. Mm -hmm. We're a nonprofit here in Lafayette, and we actually train all the drivers over at uh, La Marina Village, and uh, we don't charge for our services. And what we do is we have free rides to seniors and veterans. Uh, who need escorted rides. I know La Miranda Village does a little bit more with people who don't need escorted rides. Uh, we focus on all the seniors who need escorted rides. And we also have a uh, emergency plan for all of our members. So if there is an fire or emergency, I'll be calling every single one of our members and saying, hey, do you need a ride out? So we have that in place for our members also. Uh, and because 85 percent of the people who died in the campfire were over 65 years old so that's why we have that position the other thing is uh being i'm also a chamber ambassador uh, we do have a new store in lafayette uh, the pedigo um, uh, electric bikes so if you're looking for a way to get around town just want to put that out there. Electric bikes are fun and they're a great way to get around town. I have an electric bike myself, so just want to put that out there for you too. Besides using the Sun Shuttle, we have, we have electric bikes here in a store here. Actually, a couple of our other shops here, um, uh, our bike shops have electric bikes too. So, that's it. Great. Th thank you, David. Yes, no, I think that's a good point. Yeah, I know Sharp Bicycle and others have, a, have uh, electric bikes as well, so that's phenomenal. And thanks for a very timely update. Yes, I agree. I saw. I figured you might have a good something good to add to that. That. Yeah. Um, and are there other questions? And actually, I, before we do this, I think Sharon, I want to say the dog on your lap is adorable. So I would <laughs> definitely not definitely don't hide the video because it it adds a lot to the uh, to the discussion. Great. Uh, any other other questions for the mayor? We we have him uh, for like twenty more minutes or so, and I think it's an important chance to to hear, hear from him. There are other updates we can give as well, but are there any other questions? Okay, well, someone's thinking of, oh, okay. Okay. Would you, yes, actually, it, does, it actually looks like AJ has, got, has a question for you, Mayor. Yeah, um, I had a quick question. Um, the develop, the uh, objective design standards that you were talking about developing for downtown, I know you, you discussed that in conjunction with the desire and need for more park space downtown. Um, and I was curious if the city is thinking about or exploring the use of uh, Popos, uh, publicly, privately owned, publicly, I forget the last, oh, but um, what they do in San Francisco where they have, um, you know, publicly available space on private property, is that something that the city is exploring at all? Well, that's something we will need to look at as part of the overall plan. Um, you know, there's a number of ways to uh, approach it. One is increasing the impact fees generally, the impact fees for the, the fund for parkland and the, the uh, fund for park facilities. Another is 
possibly creating a special zone in the downtown that any new development would need to pay into for the development in the downtown. Another would be requiring on campus, you know, play facilities for a development of a particular size. We need to look at all of those because the one thing for sure is we can't have more kids living in the downtown and not have uh, play facilities for them. So we'll we'll find a way uh, for sure. And also, I apologize, I didn't introduce myself to those uh, who don't know me. My name is AJ Glassman. Um, I'm the membership engagement coordinator here at the Lafayette Chamber. Apologies for those on the call. Yeah, no, no, AJ is a good, AJ is definitely a good one to uh, to be in contact with. Definitely, definitely helps all the chamber members and well, businesses well, throughout Lafayette. John, while we're waiting for a question, I, I need to tell another story, another yes. uh, uh, development, and that's in the area of our sustainability efforts, which I think yes. is very exciting because we have a very uh, active environmental task force, and they have what I refer to as a, a legislative agenda. Um, well, there's a number of things, but one is the legislative agenda, and uh, the council did uh, during this uh, past year uh, uh, well, the Environmental Task Force recommended and the council adopted uh, minimum standards for uh, EV charging facilities in multifamily residences. And our uh, standards are uh, higher than the state standards that went into effect on January 1st. So the idea there is that everyone should have access to uh, EV charging in the future because that's, that's just, we need to be able to have that. Uh, the Environmental Task Force is also looking now at um, uh, an ordinance that would, to put it as simply as possible, uh, ban uh, uh, gas-powered uh, leaf blowers. Um, so uh, that may be coming to the council in the next uh, month or so. And the council, uh, the, the task force is also looking at um, uh, an ordinance that would require uh, uh, new uh, de development to be uh, basically use electric appliances and for replacements to be electrical appliances. So that's on the legislative front. And, and then <clears throat> they were looking for ways that uh, we could get individual residents involved in sustainability. And so that led to the recommendation that to the council that Lafayette become part of Sustainable Contra Costa. And we did that uh, a couple of months ago. That gives us access to Sustainable Contra Costa's uh, platform, the Cleaner Contra Costa Challenge, which is a way for households, individuals to go in, register, and uh, undertake, uh, well, there's a, a wide variety of things that people can do to save carbon, to save water, and so people can register there. Now, and, and start doing these things and, and gaining points for doing that. Uh, and then another interesting thing, there's a dashboard on Sustainable Contra Costa that shows the the scores, aggregate scores for residents of cities. So once we joined, um, Lafayette now has a score. And embarrassingly, in my view, uh, the Lafayette score is below Moraga and Orinda. So we have challenged uh, Moraga and Orinda, and actually the city council adopted a resolution at the last meeting officially challenging Moraga and Orinda to see who can do more over the next year uh, to save carbon, save water. And the immediate thing, there's actually going to be a challenge within the challenge. Uh, there's the La Mirinda Zero Waste Challenge, which Sustainable Contra Costa is supporting. That will begin on uh, April 3rd. It will go from April 3rd to May 14th. The kickoff event is next Tuesday, uh, um, March 28th, in the uh, Don Tatson Community Hall. Uh, there'll be a presentation on what people can do. Council Member Kwok is going to talk about his experience in converting his house to all electric. There'll just be uh, a, a good kickoff to this uh, uh, campaign, but we want to get as many people as possible interested in that. Now, at the same time, the Environmental Task Force has teamed up with the uh, um, Lafayette Community Center and uh, have made available four induction cooktops and four uh, uh, electric uh, leaf blowers to be that can be checked out and used at home by people who just want to see how does an uh, induction cooktop work uh, and can I actually uh, keep things clean with a uh, electric gas blower. And I, I checked with uh, Jonathan Katayanagi uh, yesterday evening and 
all of them are checked out. So uh, we just put them, <laughs> got them, got the kit set up, and they're all checked out. So people are taking advantage of that. So I encourage if you want to try an induction cooktop, uh, go on the city website, sign up, and they'll call you when one comes back and uh, has your name on it. And you can you can keep it for two weeks to try it. Thank, thank you, Mary. In fact, I think Holly has put in links for both the um, electric leaf blower lending and the cook induction uh, cooktop lending program in the in the chat, so we can uh, we can do that. Uh, David, did you have a uh, uh, something to add on this topic, or I so you? Oh, no, I I guess not. Um, no, I, I was just wondering about um, uh, we've had a lot of rain in the last couple months. Um, my question was, how safe are the homes and businesses? around the creeks because there's been a lot of water coming into those creeks and I wanted to ask uh, what what's going on with that yeah I don't know if I can answer that authoritatively but I can say that the the, the most water that we had uh, was during the New Year's rains and um, at that point the uh, the city emergency team public works the police even parks and recreation uh, were meeting on on a three times a day basis and i sat in on those meetings to see what was happening and i what i got out of those meetings is that we're very fortunate with the city staff we have and how much they care and how capable they are in terms of taking care of emergencies. But in terms of the area around the, the creeks, particularly through the downtown, I think now, well, the, the biggest the biggest uh, danger period was uh, during the New Year's floods. The, the creeks came at least at one area. Um, uh, Las Trompas Creek was pretty much up to the top. Uh, but did not go uh, over. Uh, and since then, they, they haven't been uh, a, as high. And there, at least in the downtown, I'm not aware of, uh, of any damage. Great. Thank, thank you, Marinder. There, your question came into the chat about um, a little confusion about the chamber's position with regard to uh, high density housing and so on. And uh, I know the chamber, we talked about it at, at length. And uh, Matt, Pees, who's on the call, he was he was he's not only a member of the chamber board, but he was also on GPAC and uh, really took the lead on a lot of our positioning on that. So, Matt, I don't know if you want to give a little uh, update on what the chamber thinks of the whole, you know, businesses potentially being displaced a little bit through uh, all the high high uh, you know density residential housing being proposed. Yeah, John, we we are concerned about it. Um, we originally hoped that the plan would have the housing primarily at the bar parking lots, but for a lot of reasons, that's uh, not what the the plan will say. So we put a letter to the city asking them to make sure that they consider several factors about how they do the downtown design going forward. Uh, Mayor and Gary talked a little bit about that, but to make sure that there's adequate parking, that people can walk downtown easily, look at mixed use uh, type of development. Um, look at traffic patterns on Mount Diablo and uh, other roads that feed that and ways to uh, minimize the traffic. We want to make it attractive for people to come to Lafayette to shop as well as people in Lafayette staying in Lafayette. So there was probably six or seven points that we asked um, the, the city to consider. And I know that they're looking at them. Some of them are kind of long-term, some of them are expensive. Uh, but we think it's important to do these to help preserve the businesses downtown. Thank you, Matt. I also, I think just to echo something that Carl said earlier too, I mean, the, bi the bicycle paths and be able to do more biking as well as walking downtown. Uh, we think that's important. I mean, the shuttle bus probably has something to do with it, but I think we're we're all about, uh, you know, the chamber does not want to see all of downtown converted to housing. Plus also that's one of the reasons people like Lafayette is you can actually shop downtown. That's what it's attracting people to be in the houses. So it'd be kind of counterproductive. Of everything gone so i think chambers are realistic about the state laws and we're not you know it's not about opposing at all costs it's definitely trying to work within the uh the rules that were given and being met to maximize it um so uh cheryl you had a, a question then we'll do, go to tracy cheryl so i'm really glad that last little uh question was asked it was one of my concerns and i'm glad it was brought up um can you talk a little bit about 
more about maybe Matt can do it uh, about housing by right and how that would affect the mixed use ability when developers don't necessarily have to do that and how that works. I'm not even sure how that works. Um, and then my only other qu quick thing, and I'll end it there. So um, AJ actually got me thinking about it, and that is, has the city or the park and rec thought about contacting the owner of El Charo for a park? It's three separate acre properties, so you don't necessarily have to buy all three. And I just wondered if that had been on the radar for the city or the park and rec. And I'll end it there. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Chair. Chair. So Matt, why don't you go ahead and take the first part of that? Yeah, uh, essentially, um, it's become much easier for people to develop housing in downtown. And there's less and less that the city can do to object to it. Now, having said that, um, there's still um, some authority based on design standards uh, and just the regular negotiations to work with developers to potentially ensure that there's, for example, retail restaurants on the bottom floor and maybe residential above that. Uh, and developers will work with us. Now, the trade-off on that, frankly, is it makes the buildings a bit higher um, if you're going to have the retail on the bottom. So we're, there's some trade-offs that we're going to have to think through as a community when we do this. But essentially, if an owner of land wants to develop their housing, they want to develop their land downtown for housing, they can do that. And uh, we've got to work to some degree with that owner to facilitate that. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, and that's kind of like the, the position we're in. But we'll see how many new developments come in with uh, obviously the economic conditions a little different than it was five years ago. But uh, what we're going to definitely keep an eye on that. And uh, Marin Dury, you want to take the second part of that question? El Charo. I mean, I, it's, I think everybody's probably always wondering what's what's going on with some of the vacant lots in town. And that would certainly be one of them. Yeah. And there's there's really nothing I can uh, say about that. Okay. All right. Yeah. So. All right. But good question. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, Tracy, I saw your hand go up. Do you want to, uh, you have something to bring to the uh, the group? Well, I just, a couple of things. Um, this is just a, a question, I guess, both, well, for, for Mayor Anduri in terms of the reference on the, um, the uh, design standards that they'll be looking at for the new developments coming in. And, you know, the ones that we, that have come in now, um, they're, you know, they're attractive in their way. <laughs> um and I'm just wondering if there will be more of a mix um, opportunity for architectural styles and things like that, because there seems to be a trend towards this blocky um, color blocks and, you know, square dimensions and kind of really right up on Mount Diablo Boulevard and things like that. And I'm just curious if as you create this committee, will there be, you know, designers and architects involved in it? And so it will obviously be needing to meet um, state guidelines. And, and I realize that the developers hold the upper hand in all this, but I do hope that, that the, I mean, I believe the council is very committed to an aesthetic, a certain Lafayette aesthetic, which is why the downtown historic overlay district exists for one reason, um, to protect a lot of that. And I do hope that'll be, you know, considered um, because we do, we're we're not we're not a big space to work with, and those big blocky structures can really start to overwhelm the downtown area. Um, so anyway, just a comment on that. And then, you know, um, Supervisor Anderson heard this from me before, but as a representative of the Park Theater Trust, I wanted just to publicly thank her um, on behalf of the board of directors for her incredible support. And, and the, the grant that she was able to secure for us from the Contra Costa Livable Communities Trust. And it was very, very, we were very grateful for it. Um, it's going to very good use because we have our final plans that will be um, made more public over the coming weeks. And um, just wanted to, to thank you again, Supervisor Anderson for that. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Do we have any other questions for uh, for the mayor? Anything else? So I know, uh, Mayor, we had there were I know a couple of things that we didn't have a chance to get to the opening would be uh, one about the Go Slow Lafayette campaign. I don't know if you want to give an update on that. Uh, yes. Uh, 
<clears throat> there are a, a couple of things I, I talked about. The the um, the council sets the priorities, but it is true that a new mayor does have some things that uh, he or she uh, wants to do. And and I, I had four of them. One of them was uh, uh, collaborating with the, the the chamber on visiting businesses, and uh, that was uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, another one was celebrating 175 plus years of Lafayette history, and we can talk more about that. Uh, a third was the sustainability challenge, doing more to get individual residents involved with sustainability. And the fourth was to get people to drive slower in Lafayette, because we have, a, I think, personally think we have a problem with uh, people uh, driving too fast on our roads. And um, <clears throat> um, definitely the, uh, the chief uh, uh, agrees, uh, and um, we've had some really good meetings and uh, the way that this is going to be approached uh, is uh, the um, chief and his group looked at what what they would uh, what would be useful for them in order to uh, uh, um, help with enforcement and we came up uh, with something that was approved by the council uh, in the the last meeting in February. And that is that the, the, the police department pro proposed to uh, uh, expand its capability in, in the traffic safety area through an investment in technology and equipment. Uh, so equipment that we can place on the streets uh, that we can provide real-time speed feedback, but also then gather data that can be used to determine what areas traffic enforcement needs to focus on. So there's a... a equipment that's been ordered now and uh and when it gets here and it starts being deployed well there'll be a communications messaging campaign to let people know that it's out there and why it's out there encourage people to uh go drive no uh faster than the speed limit uh and uh and make our streets uh, safer so there's two portable radar trailers that are coming um, these are the ones that show the, the speed that you're going, uh, but these have the advantage then of being able to record data uh, over a long period of time. And so that data will be available. Um, and then there's a couple of this, those same sorts of uh, radar signs that can be put on uh, posts. Uh, and again, those not only show the, the speed, but uh, record the, the data. And then there's black boxes, radar uh, boxes that will be, uh, the, the, you, don't, you don't see a flashing light, but they can record two-way speeds. Those can also be used by our public works department in uh, their traffic engineering. And then the fourth is the uh, advanced LIDAR units, those units that the uh, uh, patrol officers hold to determine your speed as they're standing by the side of the road. Uh, they're getting two new ones of those will be used by our inf uh, traffic enforcement officers. The two existing ones will be used by patrol officers. Uh, so we'll have a lot better equipment. We ho also hope to be able to make all the speed data available on the city's website. So if people are wondering, well, what is the you know average speed on my well, it won't be each street, but on the main thoroughfare, they can look and see what it is. So it'll be very uh, transparent going forward. So there's more to come in that uh, category, but we hope to, yeah, as part of the, uh, the priority uh, of uh, uh, prior, the second priority I mentioned of, of traffic safety. Excellent. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I know we're wrapping up a couple minutes, but Libby, it looks like you have your hand up. Do you have a question for the mayor? Um, Oops, sorry, Libby. It looks like you're still muted, though. No, oh, almost there. <laughs> there you um, go. Gotcha. Cheryl, Cheryl had her hand up. I think I think Cheryl's hand hand I think was raised from the previous question that she had. That's the oh, reason. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, this is the first time I've ever done this, and I'm sorry I came in late because I all of a sudden remembered. Ah! Um. But, uh, and I don't know if this has already been covered. Um, and I don't know, maybe it's not appropriate for this type of meeting, but I kind of wondered, uh, since you were talking about the uh, 
you know, the downtown area and the housing and and it seems like the chamber is also very concerned. Um, there's a lot of people in Lafayette that are very concerned. And I wondered if the if the mayor or the city council has thought about things to push back on the overreach of the uh, legislate the state legislature um, on a lot of these a lot of these house housing bills housing laws um, you know I I know that some people on this call are you know pro uh, affordable housing and like who isn't um, is my response to that um, but the fact is that the housing laws that are being written that are being passed have absolutely nothing to do with providing or requiring affordable housing. Uh, Lafayette as a city can only require up to 15% of any project to be affordable if it's within a half a mile of BART. Um, and the fact of the matter is a lot of these housing laws that are being passed are being written by and for the benefit of the wealthy real estate developers, uh, the wealth real estate development uh, uh, lobbyists up in Sacramento. And so, my question is: mm -hmm. my question is, um, for example, uh, the League of California Cities mission statement says hey, Libby, Libby I want to be we, we have like one minute left do you just have a okay. quick question I just need a question um, for the mayor that's all the League of California Cities has said that you know they're there to support local control only they haven't been doing that so might the city consider not paying their dues to the League of California Cities because they're not supporting us Great. Thank, thank you, Libby. For the, so, uh, Mr. Mayor, do you have anything you want to, as to wrap up? Any kind of question about uh, pushing back or not? No, I, I just want to point out in case there's any uh, uh, confusion on it. Lafayette has an inclusionary ordinance, so uh, any housing development uh, needs to be 15% affordable wh wherever it is. It's not uh, within half a mile uh, of, of BART. I think, um, Ms. Henry, you're, you're referring to the uh, requirement for parking. That's right. Um, that's a new new state law. But there's no uh, our inclusionary ordinance uh, applies throughout the downtown, not just within a half a mile of of BART. Uh, your specific question, I know the city will continue to be a member of the League of California Cities. It's been a very useful organization for us to be part of. Really? Oh, I, I'd be interested to know how exactly they've supported us. All right. I think we'll have to kind of, we will wrap it up on there. Thank you, Libby. I think uh, I know the mayor is always, uh, if you want to kind of reach out to him individually. So um, I think with as we're at the nine o'clock um, mark, we will wrap it up. I want to thank everybody uh, on behalf of Sarah, AJ, Holly, um, Linda, Ginny at the chamber uh, for coming and uh, attending the Ma Coffee with Mayor. It's always terrific to hear from uh, our elected officials directly. And uh, Supervisor Anderson as well, of course, for joining. We 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 really appreciate your time and uh, spending time with it. I think the Zoom uh, Zoom thing works really well, so I think we should count on that. We I know we have another one coming up in a, a few months. Uh, Holly will be sending out all the information to everybody. Be sure to uh, sign up for our e blast so you hear the latest going on in Lafayette. So, Mayor, thank you very much for taking the time with us. Okay, thank you everyone for right. spending part of the morning. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah.